Get your money ready, people, because today on Two Black Guys with Good Credit, we are talking about the stock market. Is it legalized gambling or a great investment opportunity? We're going to discuss how it works. Does it work for the long term or short term? And who are the real winners and losers? So stay tuned to Two Black Guys with Good Credit. We're getting it done. With Good Credit. What's up, podcast family? My name is Sean. And I am Arlington. So, Sean, man, do you have some kind of insider information or something for our listeners? Why are we talking about the stock market? Insider information, Arlington. If I had insider information, I'd be on my private jet, landing in St. Bart's, and co-producing the Swimwear Sports Illustrated 2017. Arlington, I just want people to have a clear understanding of how the stock market works and realize, even if they're not heavily invested in the market, they're still invested by the day-to-day decisions that they make. That makes sense to me, Sean. Knowledge is king. Matt, are you in? I'm all in, Arlington, and I brought sponsors. This first break is brought to you by Canvas Malibu. Canvas Malibu is a boutique and contemporary art gallery located in Malibu, California. At Canvas Malibu, it starts with art, and their curated offering of shoes, apparel, accessories, and art are a definite must-see. Canvas Malibu is located in the Malibu Country Mart or online at canvasmalibu.com. Before we get into how the stock market actually works, Dion, the lady with the facts, can you please give us a little history on the New York Stock Exchange, a.k.a. the market? My pleasure, Arlington. The New York Stock Exchange, otherwise known as the NYSE, originated in the 1800s, known as the Curb Exchange, until 1921. It was actually a marketplace at the curbstone on Broad Street and Exchange Place in New York. The modern-day NYSC is actually the world's largest stock exchange, valued at over $19 trillion. Now, for those who don't know, the NYSC basically provides a means of, for buyers and sellers to trade shares of stock in companies, otherwise known as securities trading. A share is a unit of account. In this case, it means to own a piece of a company. Corporations sell shares to raise capital, aka money, to run their business. The owner of the share then becomes a shareholder, which means they now own a piece of that company. Uh, let's get it right. You get a piece of you, you get you get a certificate. You get a piece of paper. I mean, you can't walk into the you buy stock in Chase. You're still going through security like everybody else. Okay, you go out. Don't be bringing saying I bought Apple shares and you can go down to Silicon Valley and act like you're part owner of Apple and sit beside you know <laughs> CEO. That's funny. You're getting a certificate <laughs> and it says I have a share. Okay, don't go and let our audience get twisted. Some I know somebody out there will be like I own two shares of Apple. Open up the doors for me, security. <laughs> let me through <laughs> so let's just make sure everybody understands when you say ownership <laughs> all right so let's just get to it after sean just broke it down the first thing man off the top what do you need to know before you dive into the stock market it's like with anything else in life i mean if you fail to plan you plan to fail you need to understand what's my strategy here what am i trying I'm to get trying out to of make stock money market? that's yeah. the bottom line that's what I'm trying to do. Make okay, money. well, well, that you know, making money. There's, there's, a, there's the art of making money. You know, and if, if you keep listening show by show, you're going to see that there's a true art into making money. So even if you're going to say, "I want to make money," are you making money for the long term, the short term? What are you, right. what, what are you trying to do? That's what you have to ask yourself. And what's my right. level of risk? What's my tolerance level? You know, am I a person that can accept? A high risk, low risk, you know, those are things you need to ask. So me, I'm very conservative, as I say. I love to say throughout the show, I'm financially conservative, and my risk level right. is, is not that high, believe it or not, you know. There was a recent survey that was conducted by Prudential, and they found that more than 58% of the 1,000 investors that they polled between ages 35 and 70, they said they had lost faith in the stock market. And even more alarming, 44% said they plan to never, ever invest in stocks, ever. The stock market was, you know, it has its, it has its weaknesses like everything else. You know, it's, it has its weaknesses. And there's, you know, it's, it's still run and created by man. And there's, 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 there's holes in it. Like I always tell Arlington, you know, you know the, there's true winners in the market and there's true losers. And I think, right. you know, the most people that, that luck out in the market are those that are very close to the market. But, 
the average investors like you and I that are distance, it's really we have to be more on top of it and manage our money very conservatively in the stock market. But what do we need to know when we're trying to when we're even thinking about buying a stock? What do, what do we need to know? Read a book, get advice. <laughs> Don't just pick blindly. You know, it's 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 it. To me, I look at it. You know, people may shoot me down for saying it, but I'm sorry. Right. I look at it as legalized gambling. And you but have it's to not man- gambling. You still get your. When you gamble, you roll the dice. You acquire no assets. When you buy a piece of stock, you own a portion of a company, which is an asset. So it's not really gambling. I'm sorry, you didn't see what happened in 2008 when the market crashed. Yeah, but since 2008 to now, the market's been up what 40 percent. Stocks turn to penny stocks to junk bond stocks to you know all the time. That's the stock prices go up and down. Sean, can I tell you a story? Oh, here we go. I mean, the story is based in facts, but let's just break it down. When you talk about, as you mentioned, timing and crashes in the market. So um, this gentleman, uh, Ben Carson, he's an institutional portfolio manager, right? Wait, Ben running for the Republican Party? Uh, Not that Ben. (laughs) (laughs) He did an analysis of one of his unluckiest clients, right? He had the worst market timing in history. And Mm -hmm. he still made money. So let's call him Bob, okay? The first time he invested was in 1973, right before the the big crash, the 48% crash of the S&P, all right? However, Bob held on to his stocks after the drop. He actually saved $46,000, didn't have the nerve to commit anything else until about 1987, right before the next big crash of 34%, okay? But Bob Bob continued to hold tight, only making two more investments, right before the crash in 2000, and then again right before the other crash in 2007. By the end of it all, Bob... After 42 mm-hmm. years of misfortune, had $1.16 million. On a total investment of how much money, Dion? On a total investment of $584,000. A mere pocket change. There's two important things that you said in this whole thing, so we don't confuse or mislead our, our listeners, okay? One, the reason why Bob was successful, because he was in it for the long term. And I believe okay. the stock you can you can do well in the stock market if you have a long term perspective on it. And okay. secondly, I don't need to see Bob's portfolio to know that he was well diversified, meaning Got that you. I'm sure he didn't have one or two stocks. He had a portfolio of different stocks <laughs> in different sectors. So he probably had some oil stocks. He may have had some banking stocks. He may have had some real estate stocks. He may have had some blue chip. You know, he was well diversified. Two two in- important ingredients: diversification. And long term, that's why Bob was probably or Ben was probably successful. That is the key, actually. Well, exactly. I want to put Bob on the side for a minute. What do you need to know when picking a stock? If you're starting out looking at stock, the best thing to do is to get professional help and, and, and research. You're really just trying to predict that, hey, if I buy this company over the some period of time, I believe that they're going to go up for a number of reasons. Okay. And to me, I, I think one you know, if, if you don't seek the professional help, I, I like to, you know, purchase stocks that I have a relationship with those companies. Like one of the best stocks I bought early on was, was JetBlue. I went on a JetBlue flight and mm-hmm. I just had an amazing experience. It was so different than any other airline I've taken. And I was like, they're onto something here. And so you bought the stock. <clears throat> immediately. How much money do I need to get in? Is like, is the amount of money I have, you know, to put towards the market, is that, Im- is that important? No, you can you can you can invest a dollar. There's penny stocks out there that you can buy. You know, you can open up a Charles Schwab account. I'm not marketing for Charles Schwab, but you can open up an account, self manage the account yourself. Trades are minimal cost to do a trade, and you know you don't you don't need a you can start with a dollar if you really want to. So in short, you need to determine for yourself: Are you in it for the long term or the short term? You need to get yourself some professional assistance, or grab a book, as Sean said, and do your research when picking a stock. You might want to consider something that's close to home, or if your risk tolerance is pretty high, go for something you don't know a darn thing about. But the bottom line is, next segment we're going to get into, is it truly a long or short-term solution for making money? But right now, let's shoot it over to Matt for our next sponsored break. 
Thanks, Arlington. This sponsorship break is brought to you by Clean. Clean is a financial literacy program designed to educate youth in a fun and interactive way through class lessons, workshops, and web seminars. To bring it to a school or organization near you, please visit www.financiallyclean.com. NickNightDirect.com is the fast, easy way to shop online. To buy an item from any U.S. website, just go to NickNightDirect.com. That's N-I-C-N-A-T Direct.com. Choose your method of payment and we'll ship, handle duties, and deliver your item straight to your door. I'm Sean of NickNightDirect.com and you have my word. Okay, so what we really need to talk about here, Sean, is can you or should you use the market to try to make money in the short term or long term? Is it feasible? Well, Dion, do you have any facts on people that make money or lose money in the stock market? Because that's what I want audiences to hear first. You may have heard of this guy. His name's Warren Buffett. But, but, he's, but I'll tell you, there's actually a gentleman um, who outperforms Warren uh, he's worth $21.3 billion. His name is Carl E. Kahn. He actually is the only one living investor that has the length of track record that compares to Warren Buffett. And he's been making about 30% annually on his investments. So, Sean, how important is time when, when I'm considering investing? Should I, should I be trying to get in and out or should I just put it in there and let it ride? Um, I, I think for the most part, the stock market, like I said earlier, is, is something you should be looking at as a long-term objective rather than a short-term objective. Those that try to make it in the short term, you really have to be skilled. I mean, you really have to know markets, understand um, what's going on in the stock market in order to really to be successful in the stock market. Uh, you know, our audience could be like, oh, you're lying. You know, I, I put $10 in Chase stock and I took it out and made, and it sold at $18 and I made $8. So I don't know what Sean's talking about. Well, well, I mean, yeah. there are day traders. Yeah, well, day traders is a whole different thing. They open at they open and close in the same day. That's really what a day trader does. But but it's short term. Yeah, but like <laughs> I said, you may win on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but eventually the odds are going to catch up, and you're going to lose. I mean, people don't understand this. You know what the average rate of return typically every year? Do you know what the rate of return is? Seven percent. Exactly seven percent. And sometimes I have to ask myself honestly. Why all the fuss for 7%? Like, I mean, I just think there's other ways in which you can make a 7% return on your investment. I know you don't like me to you lose the scenario, but I can buy a 24 case of bottled water, hit the corners in Brooklyn, hit the streets in Brooklyn, and sell those for a dollar each, make $24 off a $4 investment. The thing you hear about guys like Tim Sykes, Sean, you know that wonder kid who took his bar mitzvah money? He took $12,450. And turn it into two million dollars by the age of twenty-two. Now, how long was he in the market? Long term or short term? Well, I'd say he was about thirteen by twenty-two. That's like nine years. And wasn't that kid trading penny stocks? Yeah, and that's where how he made his money it was in penny stocks. Um, he's now teaching other people how to do it, and he's now got students making you know who have surpassed the million-dollar mark. Okay, Sean, do you think investing is for the rich and the educated? No, no. One thing about the stock market, it allows you to do, you don't, you know, there's people that have limited education and being able to make a ton of money on Wall Street. I've worked with some of them personally, to be honest with you. So (laughs) (laughs) I just believe it's, you know, it's your level of risk and your level of understanding. And, you know, I've sat there and watched my stock go up and down and I'm sweating. And some people just ride it through and be like, oh, well, I'll just let, I'll ride it out. I I don't have the the patience to ride it out. Dion, what's the percentage of it? of Americans with the cojones to even get into the market? Well, <laughs> honestly, Arlington, about 55% of people say they, they aren't going anywhere near it. So what are you trying to say, Arlington? Hold on. This is an important stat. Are you trying to say one out of every two Americans has no cojones? <laughs> Possibly. <when it> comes <laughs> That's to their money. what you've just told the American people. Well, I think that you made a good point because the reality is, it's interesting. The stock market's here. Since the crash in 08, the gains have been, on av- have been around 38%, but less than half the American population is actually in the market. They're saying three out of four millennials, you know, who can afford to take more risk because they have more time to recover from losses, have no activity in the market. 
but I think sometimes people are in the market and they don't even realize it. Like sometimes you have you probably you you may have through your 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 company's pension plan is and in, maybe invested in the market. You don't even know that they may be buying stock. Part of their portfolio may be stocks. There may be some mutual funds that you have that are, that have stocks. Your purchase decisions. Everybody keeps buying Apple, Apple, Apple. That affects the stock price. You know. So even though you're not directly involved in the stock market, you are indirectly. You know. That's why sometimes it's good to buy American products. If you buy American products, you support American businesses, which affects American stock prices. You know, those are the things that you should be conscious of when making these decisions, understanding that, you know, you are invested. Once you purchasing items, goods and service, you are making an investment in the market. Very well said. But just to give an idea of the four top reasons they're saying Americans don't get into the exactly. stock market. This is actually a survey that was um, conducted by Howard R. Gold for Market Watch. Um, one, they plead ignorance. One in five people plead ignorance. They just don't know right. enough about it. Two, uh, one in 10 just don't trust the people who actually are supposedly um, supposed to enlighten them, whether it's the stockbrokers, financial advisors. Third, they say 7% just think stocks are too risky. And the biggest reason people haven't invested in the stock market is because they 53% say they just can't afford to. Right. I think this thing that happens in the market, which is really interesting, is that People feel they can't afford to do it because by the time they get enough courage to get in, the stock they wanted to buy is super expensive. Well, I believe that's all relative. I mean, if that stock is expensive, then there's another one that's not so expensive. Then it's just digging a little deeper, expanding your horizons and and, and working with somebody that will show you different options. I mean... There, like I said, in the long term, I think the stock market is a good place to place and hold your money. But if, if you're trying to do some short-term flips in and out, I don't think it's the right arena for that, unless you're really well educated in the market itself. So, Sean, you were saying stocks could be a good part of a diversified portfolio. But I think you need to explain what, do you, what you mean by a diversified portfolio. Your, your, your investment portfolio is a mix. It can be a combination of many things. One of those combinations can be investing in real estate. Another one can be you have something where it's called, um, or it's an FDIC insured investment, mean, meaning that the, your returns are guaranteed, which is like a certificate of deposit or a CD or a treasury note. And then another part of it can be a small business, a friend that you want to invest in their business. And then the final part can be the stock market. So then you look at your total rate of return on your investment. People sometimes like to dissect their investment portfolio and look at just a small pocket of it, but you should really be looking at your total rate of return. And if there's some things in your portfolio that are not performing so well, then you can adjust your portfolio. So if your stock market is a small, is a percentage of your entire portfolio, that means if it, you won't, you shouldn't be truly if you do bad in the market, it shouldn't affect affect your entire portfolio. It'll affect a percentage of it, but not your entire portfolio. So that's yeah. what I mean by it. And then you can even be a little diversified within the stock market by meaning picking stocks that are not correlated in any sense so that you can buy stocks in oil and then also buy stocks in healthcare or buy stocks in and you know retail and brick and mortar and then also buy stocks in you know foreign markets so that if one sector is doing bad you may be doing well in another sector you, that means you may not get the highest rate of return but you you should be getting consistent overall maybe positive rate of return and to me that's what you want to do and you just really want to beat that 7% mark Dion what's the current trend on portfolio diversification well, interestingly enough, it's actually going to the other extreme. So either, you know, pundits are talking about going 100% stocks. Um, if not, they're saying 80-20. So 80% stock, 20% bond, put all your eggs in one basket and let it ride. Wow. I'm so not Sean? surprised at that stock. It's just incredible, the mindset. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't sit here and act like I agree with that. It's just, we're, a, we're living in a society now where it's based on instant gratification. We got to get things right away. Information has to come right away. Returns have to come right away. We have to become a millionaire overnight. And I just think the days of like slowly building your wealth and, and creating generational wealth is outdated. It's out of style. It's not cool anymore. And I just think, no, I think we should be diversified. We shouldn't be 80% in the stock market and 20% in bonds. We should be more diversified and, and know that growth can be slow and it can be, in, and it can be it's okay. It's fine. But, okay. but I think what they're talking about is the big payoff. Go heavy on stocks long term, ride it up and down, 
and it's going to pay off big for you by the time you retire. You're going to be in your 60s and 50s and buying all these left all these d- risky stocks and think you're going to just flip your money and 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 then make millions of dollars overnight. It's not true. You got to, you know, when I started buying stocks, looking at stocks, it was very conservative outlook. He's like buy blue chip, start off with blue chip stocks. Stocks that's been around for a while like GM you know, companies have been around for hundreds of years, right. buy into their stocks, slowly build around those core stocks. And then if you want to take a little risk and buy some a couple of new companies here and there that, do, that ha- don't have much of a track history, go ahead and do that. But fundamentally, have blue chip stocks, core stocks that you know always perform decently and give but you... But isn't that, you know, the, isn't that the, the lane for someone who's very risk averse? No, that's the lane for keeping your money, and your money is your money <laughs> protecting your money. That's the lane that I want to be in. That's the lane that I want to be. All right, Sean, just hold the phone for a second. You've been using this term blue chip stock and throwing it around liberally like everyone understands what you're talking about. Can you please define a blue chip stock? You're absolutely right, Arlington. Blue chip stocks are giant companies with solid reputations. Think of General Electric Intel, American Express, Walmart, and Walt Disney, like financially fit corporations that with dependable earnings, usually paying additional income to investors in the form of dividends. And Too dividends mean, I, I know you're going to ask me the question of dividends. Dividends mean that the company has made solid earnings and they're deciding to share in the profits with their investors and they pay them out in the form of dividend payments. Got you. So it's kind of like a too big to fail. Kind of. Right, exactly. To be dependable. It has a proven track record. You know, like me. I'm dependable and I got a proven track record. Just think of me. I'm I'm blue chip, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, from since Sean's blue chip, we're gonna take that and go right into commercial. But keep in mind, long term, yeah, that's where the money seems to be made in the market. We'll be right back. Matt. Starting a new business or growing an existing one requires someone who understands how to build brands. LIC Marketing Group will take the time to listen to your specific needs and help you achieve your business goals. With over 15 years' experience in branding and marketing, your company will be given the tools necessary to be recognized and grow in a challenging environment. Services include logos, websites, packaging, brand identity systems, marketing campaigns, and social media strategy. Call 718-932-6367 or visit licmarketing.com and click on Portfolio to see our award-winning designs. Don't wait any longer. Get started promoting your business today. At Shea Essence, they take great care in handcrafting their line of skincare, offering smooth textures and delicate natural aromas. They invite you to try their assortment of products for kids and adults and discover the difference Shea Essence can make in your life. Start shopping now at www.sheaessence.ca. Your skin is craving something good. Here's the thing that I really want to get to with you, Sean, in this show. Do you, other than long term, do you even like the stock market? Because I get a sense that you really couldn't care for it. I appreciate the market, but like I've stressed throughout this show, I just I look at risk versus reward, and you know maybe I'm a little biased because I've I've only, I've really just bought mostly New York real estate and ventured a little bit outside New York, but for the most part I've stayed inside New York, and I just think that you know with when I'm looking at just straight return of investment and risk, I just think real estate is the way to go, and I've known a lot of guys invest in the market. They eventually go to real estate. They have some stake in real estate, so. I think the market is good as a holding place and a, and a long-term look, but I'm not a fan of short-term returns in the stock market. It's legalized gambling. Well, there is gambling. a fact just comparing you know, overall performance, real estate versus the stock market. Over the 38 years between 1975 and 2013, if you invested $100 in the average home, you would end up by 2013 with about $500. But they said if you actually invest the same hundred dollars in the S and P during that same time frame, your money would have grown to sixteen hundred dollars. Wow! And, and you got to remember too, it's an individual thing. Because remember, look, I'm the guy that goes to, to Vegas for the free buffets and the free and and the gets and tries to go to free shows. <laughs> I'm that guy. I'm going to Vegas for the for the buffet and the five dollar breakfasts. Okay, and some people you. go to Vegas and sit on a table all day long, and that's not me. So the, you know, it's all the level of level of risk in which you are. You're, I've you're, been, I'm with you, my man. I've been doing the double dutch on the stock market for the last twenty years. I'm I'm like the guy leaning in, leaning in, leaning in. 
but I still haven't gotten in between the ropes. And you know, so. another thing for, you know, I look at, you know, even long term, we I mean, we, we talked about this in retirement. You know, I'm a huge fan of you know f- f- good 401k plans that have profit sharing and that where you have matching programs. And to me, if you're if you're working for a, a good decent company and they give and they even give you a 10 percent matching program, you're out of, right there outperforming Wall Street. So why take on certain unnecessary risk? I don't see it. I'm not that type of greedy person. If my company is going to match and give me a 10% return on every dollar I invest or more, then I'm just going to be very conservative within my portfolio because I'm getting a great return already, and I don't want to lose risk losing that. Yeah, that's but just no, smiling. I mean, I think that's a great concept, but the reality is people don't work anywhere long enough to maximize that money into retirement. But don't jump on that because it's time to get to the bottom line. We got to wrap this puppy up. The stock market is not for the faint of heart or the risk averse. And while the winnings can be big, if you don't have it to lose, then it may not be for you. The market is definitely a proven moneymaker. Yes, it and real estate, as Sean will tell you repeatedly week after week. But so are you. What you have to figure out is can you outpace the market? I always bet on black myself. Sean? Arlington, my takeaway is is if you are a novice investor, do not use the stock market as your get-rich plan. Also, do not let anyone convince you to invest all your money in the market. Invest only what you can afford to lose and, and, and make sure you're always diversified as much as possible. Well, there you have it. The stock market show is in the bag. The bell has rung. We're done for the day. And hopefully you got some good information that you can use and move forward. And we gave you a few laughs along the way. Remember to email us any questions you may have to Two Black Guys Good Credit at financiallyclean.com. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Two Black Guys Good Credit. And stay tuned because each week we're going to bring something to you that you never heard before in a way you've never heard it, and you're going to enjoy it. And we'll be back from Two Black Guys with Good Credit. I'm Arlington, and I'm out. I'm Sean, and I'm out of here. See you next week, podcast family. And I'm Dion, lady with the facts. See you next week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.